Hello and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and today I have a walkthrough for you, a comparative walkthrough of two versions of the uh, Vandenborg Tarot deck. Um, this is a Flemish or Bacchus style tarot uh, from circa 1780 and I have two different printings of it. So let's take a look at these and we'll go through them. So on the left, I have this uh, modern reproduction, um, which has been uh, recolorized to some degree, retouched. And this is by a group, I believe it's like a mother and son or something who work on this together, um, or mother and daughter, called the Cardamancer. And they have a shop, I'll link it um, below this video, and sell um, reproductions of historic decks on modern card stock. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about the differences between these two, but just so you know what this is, this is like a playing card stock. Um, I don't think this has a linen, yeah, it does have a slightly linen finish on it, um, which you may or may not be able to see, um, but it has that slight linen-y kind of texture to it and it's very slippery. Um, it's plasticized. I don't think these cards are 100% plastic, but they definitely have that um, like impregnated plastic uh, coating on them, and they're what we would consider standard tarot size today, um, so that you would get in other decks. And then on the uh, right side here, I have a version from around, I think it's 1983, of the same deck, um, same source material. Yep, 1983, um, and it was produced by Cartamundi, was the printer, and um, US Games. So, um, you know, this was a Stuart Kaplan production of this deck. Again, same source material. We'll even see in the line work and where you have like missing bits of ink and things. Um, we'll see that as we go through. Um, and so what differentiates this deck is, in part, the art style. Um, it is It would be in the Marseille family or the Marseille tradition, um, but it deviates from the standard Mar Marseille tradition in a few ways. The, the numbering of the majors, the trumps, um, it has an upright hanged man, a printing error, um, and it also has um, substitute cards, different characters on the second and fifth trumps. So the high priestess um, is not the high priestess, she's also not the papess, and the pope is also not here. So we'll talk about those cards when we get to them. Um, I do want to point out that if you're looking at packaging, um, this deck is actually printed by a company called Drive Through Cards, but you can't buy it directly through Drive Through Cards. You have to buy it from the Cardamancer website. I believe they're, you know, contracting um, with drive through cards and they're marking up their price um, from that base rate. Um, so that's why you have to go through there. And this card of Monday box is not um, in great shape either. Um, it's a very flimsy type of board um, that was used, but you can see the information here. So it says distributed by US Games uh, in New and it has their New York address. So this would have been in the 70s when they were still in New York. Um, and then also distributed or co-distributed and printed in Belgium. So in this card stock here um, is very much like a cereal box. It's even interesting in that it's kind of coated on one side. So this side has like a slightly waxy feel to it. And then this side really does feel like cereal box, um, the inside of a cereal box. So it's got that um, heavy texture to it and it has this darker color. Um, and kind of dull colors. Um, it's a very matte ink on here. So um, even though it looks it looks okay on camera, actually, it looks a bit more faded, I think, in real life. Um, so that's kind of a con. Obviously, this having been printed in 1983, um, it's no longer in print, but you can find copies around. I think I probably paid around $70 kind of at the top of the market. I actually don't think that people are getting that much money for this out of print deck these days. I bet you could probably pick it up for like 40, something like that off of a, a used, um, you know, or an auction site. Um, and then this one, the new one by the Cardamancer is actually kind of pricey. It's $80, um, including the tax and the shipping um, within the US. 
Um, one thing I also wanted to share that I think is a value of having the Card of Mundi deck is the booklet that comes with it. So the one, the modern one does not come with any booklet. It comes with um, one extra card and then this cover card. Um, but this one talks about the history of the deck and um, it talks about how it's a variation of the Tarot of Marseille. And then it also talks about this alternate kind of order or um, grouping that you can get. And now I need to put my fingers on it. Um, so they're called the Different Triumphs, and they, and they basically group the cards into... Um, these other, these other groupings. Um, so it talks about the, the original order. The 22 major arcana cards and their meanings are listed in this section in the same sequence and found in the, ser the sermons, or sermons, indicated by the number in parentheses. Thus, the original grouping and force of each card can be viewed before the changes took place after the 15th century. So, uh, we have the, the Magician, he stands alone. Um, we have the Empress in the Triumph of Love along, along with the Emperor, um, the Spanish Captain, Bacchus, Temperance, and the Lovers, uh, and the Chariot and Strength. And then the Triumph of Death is Wheel of Fortune, Hermit, the Hanged Man, Death, the Devil, and La Foudre, the Lightning. The Triumph of Eternity, which is the Star, uh, the Moon, the Sun, Judgment, Justice, and the World, and then ends with the Fool. So it's a different way to organize the cards by sort of theme, I guess. Um, and you can maybe do some research and find out more about that. So. Uh, anyway, not a bad little book, um, considering I feel like a lot of tarot history has been rediscovered since this deck was first published, um, but it's an interesting one. So without further ado, I will start turning over cards and we can take a closer look. Um, and oh, I will point out one more thing, which is that uh, the Card of Mundi deck is extremely thick. The cardstock is very, very thick, and so it's almost twice the thickness of the modern one. So I've split the deck in half just so that um, perspective-wise on the camera, you can kind of compare more accurately. Otherwise, these cards are going to appear a lot closer to the camera. So here we can see we do have the same image. We have the same source material used. Um, but the images have been shrunk down on the modern deck, so they don't take up as much space on the card as the Card of Mundi deck. Um, also, in some cases, the borders, I think, are a little bit different. Here you have this dashed line border, and here you have this kind of crimped pie crust uh, sort of shape. Um, but in terms of the other line work and um, and the other details, they're they're fairly close. So I think they did use the same source material for, um, you know, each company for, for creating their version. Um, on the left here, we have much darker colors and we do have better contrast. So both of these use kind of a tan background. This one uses like a solid tan, almost a yellowy parchment color, um, but fairly dark. On the left, we have um, a, Kind of, a, I guess it's meant to be sort of parchment looking, but it's actually mottled. So it looks like mm, Caucasian flesh colored marble or something back here. Um, you can see the little dark and light spots all around. And I really don't like it. I actually don't like either of these. I would love to see them on a light cream solid background. So not a stark white, but something that is lighter um, than either of these and doesn't have a pattern to it would just be a lot less distracting. But you do get richer colors over here, this dark cranberry, for example. Over here, it's more of a bright red, um, like a persimmon color or something uh, in person. So, and then this is a, you know, I would call that maybe a, a pine green. This would be like a light grass green, etc. So that carries through the whole, the whole deck. The, co the colors on this one are going to be more saturated. 
there's a position. Here is our Spanish captain, Espanol Capitano Af Afracas, Ar Aracas, um, which I've never quite gotten a clear translation of exactly what that means. Um, but basically, he is from the um, Italian uh, Commedia dell'arte, um, the comic plays um, that eventually um, kind of morphed into Punch and Judy show type of uh, with puppets and things. But he was always a, um, a satiristic character. Um, as you can see from the suggestive shape and angle of his sword, a lot of the jokes about him uh, have to do with, um, uh, you know, physical passion and or maybe, you know, feeling a certain way when certain characters walk in the room or that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of dick jokes around him. Um, and, and he's seen as a buffoon, right? He's like the butt of, of a lot of the jokes. Um, so it's weird uh, to have him in place of the high priestess or the popess. She's definitely, you know, that's, I don't think there's any like correlation between these two. I think you just have to read this as almost like a second fool uh, in the deck, perhaps, you know, or somebody, some buffoon that's kind of in your way. Um, maybe is if I was going to be reading with this deck, that's probably how I'd read him. So the third card is our Empress. And again, she's a very traditional Empress with the shield and um, her royal scepter over here. I almost called it a mace. <laughs> it's like a mace. Um, but similarly dressed here, they have um, they have changed the color. Um, so instead of green on her collar and her sleeve, it's the same blue as below here. Um, so, you know, you'll see some color variations throughout. Um, there's one card, the Hermit, uh, that we'll get to in a minute and I'll show you, um, is quite different, but, you know, at first when I saw this deck, um, uh, was available, I, I kind of wanted it. And then I looked at, um, more closely at the cards and I thought, well, it's not, you know, it's not historic. It's, they've changed the color. That's not good. You know, but in thinking about that, it's actually not not any different from what Yves Renault does in some cases, the retouching, or Pablo Robledo, or Sullivan Hisman's, you know, all these people who retouch and reproduce cards, um, to some to some extent or another, they have to make choices. And how much they change, you know, that might vary from deck to deck or person to person or what kind of mood they're in. Um, but I don't necessarily see that this that this uh, you know the cardomancer the these people have done a bad job necessarily or done it done something wrong um, by changing a few colors here and there uh, so I'll just put that out there um, yeah here's Bacchus so uh, in our fifth card instead of the Pope or the high priest. Um, or the Hierophant, or whatever whatever he is, um, we have Bacchus, we have the god of wine. And so that puts a very different spin on the whole um, idea of someone who provides uh, wine in a religious setting um, to, you know, a pagan god who encourages uh, drinking and revelry. I know there's more to Bacchus than just, you know, getting drunk, but it's certainly what he's known for. Uh, and he's astride his barrel of wine right here. So, um yeah, so that's him. So again, you know, maybe this would be um, a card that you would read about, you know, having a good time or, or letting your hair down or something like that if it came up in a reading. Um, I don't know. Put your comments below. What, how would you interpret these alternate cards? Um, here we have love. So it's not the lover or the lovers. It's love as a concept. Uh, again, very traditional with the um, similar Marseille kind of um, setting. We have a Cupid. In this case, um, it's actually just an angel um, hovering above with this sort of um, umbrella-like covering over the central figure. So they're not even shooting a bow and arrow or doing any of those traditional things. And then you have the love. What I see as the lovers would be these two figures on the left and then somebody presiding over them or counseling them or performing a marriage ceremony, who knows, 
maybe they're a, a parent or a matchmaker or something like that. Here we have the Chariot, and as in some Bolognese style decks and some other early tarots um, from the same area, um, you get a Chariot that has a single creature pulling it instead of a pair, and you get a sideways view. Um, and I, I really like this. Um, I also like that he has a tulip-shaped scepter. Um, the Charioteer has a tulip-shaped scepter like our Swiss uh, emperors do. Um, and I didn't point it out on the Emperor card, but this, this Emperor card does have a tulip-shaped scepter as well, so that's just a cool historic feature. Here we have Justice with a massive nose and, uh, yeah, sort of a solemn, somber look um, on her face. Uh, here we do see that consistency in coloring between the two versions, so the greens here are also green on the same panels of the dress and where you're using blue, it's the same. So that's a little bit more consistent. And this Hermit card, as I mentioned before, this is where um, the Cardomancer took some liberties. The other version, the original version that I've seen and other versions have this sort of peach colored uh, robe with blue highlights on it. And this just looks very washed out, you know, especially because there's not high contrast between the figure and the background. So um, I'm glad that the Cardomancer decided to go in and actually give his robes a little bit more color. Um, they've chosen a, a medium sort of gray blue here, which would be befitting of, of a monk, um, and then a darker blue uh, kind of rope belt. Uh, they've also fixed this printing error here on the eye. So they have done a little bit of retouching uh, here and there just to uh, make the images more clear. And I, oh right, I meant to look. Oh yeah, so this is this is a hermit with a book. So no lantern, um, no hourglass, and he does have a staff, or he's at least holding onto a door frame. Um, it's, it it looks a little more staff like here because it's green instead of blue, um, but he's holding onto something that looks like a stick, and then he's got a a book in his hand, our scholar. <laughs> I like to use him as the example of the perpetual PhD student, um, person that just like will not graduate. They just keep getting more and more degrees. Um, okay, Wheel of Fortune and fairly traditional again with the Marseille. Here you have something that looks like half of a bunny rabbit and then you actually have a human face over here. So it's an interesting mix of um, sometimes they all sort of look like monkeys or weird creatures. Sometimes they all look human and here you have a mix of different things. And here we have force, la force, or strength. Um, and again, holding the lion's teeth open. I like that this lion has a very um, pronounced tongue. And I don't know what this is on the side. It looks like a star um, shape, but it might just be, I, I don't know what that is. Um, maybe folds in the cloth from behind here. Um, but it almost looks like a shield or something back there. Here we have our upright, upside down guy, um, Le, Le Pen Du, but it's it's a weird misspelling. Um, so this, this card's just got all kinds of weird things wrong with it. Um, I will point out that, again, source material, so a little bit of his cheek is missing here, and they didn't retouch it in this deck. Um, as much as some of the other cards, and then and it's also missing right there. Um, but yeah, so our Hanged Man is upright, um, because the numbers are upright, the title's upright, but, you know, he should have been that way around. But it's just, it's quirky, you know, it's, this is why people enjoy these older decks, because you get, like, this historical stuff. Um, and whether you read it as significant or not, you know, in your readings, that's, I think that's just a matter of personal choice. You can add significance to it or not. Um, again, they've changed the color here on the Cardamancer version. So instead of green hose and vest and a green tree, you get sort of a brown tree um, and then dark blue hose and vest. Um, and again, I like this coloring better but because there's more variety, I think, you know, you've got blue and green here, whereas this, this is a lot of blue, but 
That's just my personal preference. Um, okay, here we have Death and a cheeky skeleton um, with his scythe. And you do get a hint, you get one hand down here. So you don't see the field of body parts and heads um, that you often get with, with these death cards, but you do get a hint of one right there. Temperance. And here, um, like some Italian decks as well, um, both from this period and later on, um, so earlier and later, you do get only one jug of water um, rather than the two. So, I mean, I guess there's two jugs of water there, but she's pouring water from one in her hand onto the floor uh, rather than holding two jugs of water and pouring them back and forth. And then you have this scepter here um, with something, butterfly, bird, eagle, flower, not sure what that is. Um, and then it almost looks like she's wearing armor. So this looks like plate armor to me. This looks a little bit like armor um, and no wings. So some of the um, so-called archangel figures in this deck do have wings. Uh, I think we saw that on Justice, but our Temperance card does not. All right. And this card gets my vote for one of my favorite devils of all time. Um, this was very popular in Flemish uh, designs and, and sort of Swedish Flemish area. Um, where you have multiple faces, you have faces not just in the belly, but in the knees, and an eye, and the elbow, and the collarbone, and the chest. And even, you know, I don't know what's going on with the nose here, but it's it's very Picasso, it's very weird. Um, you have this other, like, gnome-like uh, face down here in the throat area. So it's cool, and definitely bat-like wings with these, um, you know, kind of fleshy spine things coming through, and then a whip tail. So I like our devil. And he's not, I will also point out, sorry, <laughs> I keep thinking of things to say. Um, he's not on a plinth, and he doesn't have um, imps with him. So he's just on his own. Tearing up the countryside. All right. Here is our lightning card. So this is 16. This is in place of the tower. And here we have lightning, these jagged arrows striking a tree. We have our shepherd with the sheep underneath. And then the, whatever this is, uh, rain, of, rain of thunder, rain of terror, uh, sparks. Um, I don't know what that is. Hail, who knows? Um, in, a, in a lot of decks, it's round balls, so it does look like hail. Here, it just looks like drips of fire or something. Um, extra scary. We have the star here, and it's an astronomer. So we have a uh, measuring device and a tower, an observation tower, where you would climb up to look at the stars large star in the middle, other constellations and stars all around. Um, and I really love having a star card that is not a naked lady pouring water into a lake because for me, that doesn't say anything about stars. And um, we already have a lady pouring water in the deck, so I don't know why we need to. Um, so I like the star card a lot. Then we have the moon. Um, and sometimes the, the moon and the sun and the star represent, um, we get things kind of jumbled up. So sometimes the moon is the astronomer, um, which also works. And then here we have the moon as a spinner. So this is a distaff. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's a stick where you, um, you put loose fiber that you're turning into yarn on your on your distaff and it kind of holds it in a ball and then you pull out individual fibers from that and spin them together twist them together to make yarn or to make rope or whatever you're making so that's what this person is doing um and they're doing it at night under the stars and the moon and again we have a tree so not dissimilar from our lightning struck tree over here um, but just a different, a different thing happening. 
So that's our moon. And then here we have sun, which is reminiscent of, or, you know, Pamela Coleman Smith may have taken some imagery from cards like these um, with a person on a horse, a white horse carrying a banner. Um, and then I have another deck that's a Bolognese deck that has uh, three, like three wise men on the sun card. So the, again, there's different interpretations. These might be sun rays, you know, or just like, oh, it's hot. That's kind of um, how I think of it. <laughs> I like that the sun's like got a concerned frowning face on instead of like a happy, cheerful face. Um, like, wow, it's hot and you've got a long way to go, you know, so. Um, just a different different interpretation and i i know this is supposed to be a horse but it really does look like a donkey to me <laughs> fun with art all right judgment so here we have judgment we do have our angel with a trumpet coming out of a cloud and a swiss or belgian flag but these people aren't coming out of graves they're coming out of the woods the ground maybe they've had natural burial i don't know um there's no coffins here um is my point i guess so it's a different kind of thing and then we have the world and instead of um this is kind of a mishmash actually so you do have two faces down here and two animals up here but it's not the modern world car with the four apostle figures or the four signs of the zodiac um, in the corners and we don't just have a figure we actually have a figure on a world this is the earth right here um, but it also looks like the top of a royal scepter um, with the, the cross on it we've got the sun the moon and this is like a little scene with a building of some kind church castle I don't know what that's supposed to be um, and then our figure with the angel wings and holding um, they're still holding a uh, towel. No. <laughs> um, sorry, I can't think of my words today. Um, a scarf or a wrap or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So again, recoloring. We have this red here versus this like light blue um, on this one. So, yeah, there's our world card. And then the fool comes last. Um, which is an interesting configuration, but they are numbered, number 22. So the fool, uh, he's got a beard, um, which I like. Love, love some good thick facial hair on tarot cards. That's why I like 70s decks too. I like the mustaches. Um, got a little, I'm gonna say that's a dog uh, and looks more dog than cat-like to me. And tripping along, he's got a satchel, got a stick. Um, and does have bells on the jacket. So you get that jester thing, like a hint of it. Um, this doesn't look quite like the full-blown court jester that we sometimes see. Um, but it does look like somebody who's maybe a little eccentric. All right, so let's go to our baton cards. Um, so this is a very um, Italian style of uh, ace of batons. You have this thing that looks like a, a tree trunk with severed um, bits on it. Um, and that's this is often true for the Italian decks where you have like a club-like one for the ace and then they've modified all of the pips. So that's certainly true here. So here you get wands that are more um, like a baton, like you would hold a twirl a baton or use a baton to lead um, a band or an orchestra or, you know, do magic tricks with whatever you use a baton for. Um, I love this rich green here and this really pops off the card. And one of the things I love about this deck is the pips. So in whichever version of the printing, I just, I like the big sort of hefty, chunky art style of this wood block. I like the larger flowers. Um, the flowers are nice and big by comparison on some other decks. Um, here again, they've shrunk down the art and it really does a disservice. I like the scale of this one a lot better, um, but that's me. I also like the different colors. So you get this kind of either sage green or forest green, you get like a cranberry color, you get a gold. So it's not quite so primary. The colors are a little bit more sophisticated and I like that. So, and you'll see some numbers. Um, again, it's quite close to the Marseille configuration in terms of where the floral arrangements are, how the leaves go, and how the 
um, implements are drawn, but it has its own style. And the numbers in the middle are handy when you're doing a big spread or, you know, trying to read and do a speed reading for somebody and quickly identify what you're looking at. It's interesting that all the other ones are uh, numbered in Arabic numbers and then we have Roman numerals here. So here we go with our court cards. Here's our valet of batons. Our Chevalier of Batons. He's got spurs on and armor. Our Rienne, our Queen. Here they've cropped the artwork a little bit. So they must have cropped it out and then added this border instead of this one. Uh, and then our King. And yeah. So here they've got like a sage green, and this would still be the light blue. So a few differences here and there in the coloration. They've also made him look um, less elderly by giving him brown hair. And here he's got like the same light blue or silver hair as um, his silver breastplate. So next we have cups. Um, and I love these big sort of jelly mold style cups. This is a little bit differently uh, rendered. A lot of the Swiss ones have more of a bowl shape. It's more perfectly round. This one has this kind of swooping. It almost looks like um, what you would cook a tagine in uh, if you're making like a Moroccan dish. So it's got that same shape. Uh, and then the cups are these wide open um, cups like this. You see tulips. And these are not numbered, so you have to count. So I will just say that I don't like the cardstock on either of these. Um, this is too modern and too slick. It doesn't feel like a stork deck to me. And this one is um, too cereal boxy, too heavy. It's very hard to shuffle. Um, what I would love is something like Giordano Berti uses um, on his historic decks. And I've showed his um, his decks before, but I'll, I'll get out a card to compare. Here's our uh, Valet de Coupe. De coupe. Um, so... And this is interesting. I guess this would be a cover for this, but it almost looks like it can't be. So, um, yeah, holding holding an open cup, and then he's got the cover in his hand. I like his little hat. <laughs> Our Chevalier de Coupe, again, the different colors. So we have a brown horse and a silver horse and brown hair and silver hair. Rien de Coupe. This is what I was talking about with the Swiss style cup. This is more of that jelly mold rounder style that you often see in Swiss decks for the ace. And then the king of cups. Swords or epée. Um, this bird or parrot on the two of swords that also carries over into other Flemish decks of the time period. This isn't the only one. And same thing with the pierced crown on the three, and that's the four. It's, it's the four of coins that I'm thinking of is a shield. This one has a big flower in the center. Really like this card. Um, so you have slightly different foliage here, different arrangement of the foliage, and like the Swiss decks on the swords, you have hilts and points, and they don't even alternate. Sometimes you get hilt, point, hilt. Here you did get all the hilts on one side and all the points on the other side. So just these little differences. Numbers again to help you count. That's very handy. <laughs> um, 
I've heard of the Valet de Espay as uh, the, the Valet of Swords or Page of Swords characterized as a spy sometimes in some contexts. I can really see that. This guy certainly looks like he's checking out the situation and maybe, you know, sticking his nose where it doesn't need to be. Um, here's our knight. Our queen. And our king. So he has blonde hair. And finally, our coin suit. Um, and this has the um, the traditional attribution that's often on the two of coins. Um, and it says Swiss cards made by F. I. Van der Boer. Van der Boer card maker in Brussels. Um, and then you have F.I. Vandenborg again on a sash. Often that sash is going between the two um, coins. In this case, it's just straight across. Swiss cross on these coins. And then the shield, yeah, the four, the four of coins is what I was thinking about. I have to say, I don't love the extra cropping on this. It's not by much in some cases, but it's it's noticeable when you're comparing side by side. So that's why I like to do these videos, because it makes me look at the cards more closely, too. Uh, this is interesting, too. This almost looks uh, Arabian in a way, this little design. So I guess that's why they call it all arabesques, right? All those little doodles and swag and details. What I would love is to get an original copy of Pablo, Pablo Robledo's version of this deck. He did a version on modern cardstock that wasn't this kind of modern cardstock, and it had a, a closer to white background. He did do some touch-ups on the artwork, um, and it looks amazing, and it's not available. And if anybody knows where I can get a copy of that, let me know. Um... Yeah, here's our page of coins, and uh, he's he's got some serious eyebrows. I like I like that. Yep, and a very long torso. <laughs> These characters are drawn in such a fun way. Um, yeah, but it's hard. You know, wood carving is not easy to do, and if you make a mistake, you kind of just have to keep going. Um, this guy's got a turban on. So I like, I like that. I have some other decks with knights with turbans. Our uh, Queen of Coins doesn't look super happy. She looks a little grumpy. And our King of Coins. So yeah, that's it for the walkthrough. I, I am going to grab that other card though and just show you what I mean about cardstock. So I'll be right back. So here we have a reproduction deck from Giordano Berti. Uh, this is the Miller of 1780. I've done a video on this, um, so you can look back for that. And what I love about this cardstock that Mr. Bertie uses is that it's still relatively manageable in terms of its thickness. So if we compare the very modern slippery deck with this one. This one is slightly thicker. I would say maybe 20%. But compared with the Carta Mundi cereal box stuff, it's not nearly so thick. So this one would be another another 30% thicker than the Giordano Berti. But the thing I like about this cardstock is it feels papery, it sounds papery, it's got a matte finish on it, it's very flexible. So it feels historic, it sounds historic, 
but it shuffles like an absolute dream. And the colors also really show up nicely on it. See, 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 see colors. So that's, that's why I love this thing. Um, and I wish basically that everybody was doing historic cardstock would just do it on this because it really works. Um, yeah. So here's, look at that. Look at that. So it's just, it's so good. Um, and I'm being a little awkward because I'm shuffling way out in, in front of me. Normally I would have the cards closer to my body to do this, but I'm trying to get this on camera for you. So, you know, you just get good separation. It goes back together, but it's not, it's not shiny. Um, it has a, a very light varnish on it, but it doesn't, um, God, I need to use this deck more. It doesn't, um, reflect light like this does you know it doesn't have that gloss to it um, and that slickness this feels like plastic this feels like paper this feels like cereal box and I'm not even going to show you how how I try to shuffle this because um, it's almost impossible I have almost bent, like, bent the cards, you know, permanently, um, crease them because it's just so hard. Also, my copy of this does have a, a pronounced bow in it, so that doesn't help matters. Uh, you can see it here, how bowed it is. Um, and I've tried everything. I've tried stacking heavy books on it. I've tried putting it in a human room and flattening it out and doing all kinds of things. And it, it just... It is just bent. Um, that is just the way it is. So, you know, in terms of shuffling this, I can overhand it sort of, um, you know, but it's not, it's not great. I do not love it. And the backgrounds are too dark. Look, look, look. Can you see the difference? And this is still parchmenty. It's not white at all. Uh, that's white. Okay. <laughs> But this is a lot lighter than this. And then if we put this in here, you can see the difference. So this is like very peach. These are sort of yellowy tan-ish. This is very peach colored. Um, so maybe Mr. Bertie can get a license to uh, to print the Vandenborg, or Pablo Robledo will re-release his deck on not handmade paper or something. Um, but in the meantime, this was fun, and I'm glad you were here to go through it all with me. Um, so thank you for joining me, and I guess until next time, have fun with your tarot decks. Let me know what historic decks you're into lately, and how you read with them, and I will see you later. Bye.